Okay, good afternoon. Um, my name is Donna McCabe. Uh, I'm from uh, HP's Helion team, and I, I'm going to be talking about Swift. My colleague, Lorcan Brown, is with me as well. Uh, so we're, we're going to talk about Swift in the public cloud. So I'll just move on a bit. So the, the, for our agenda, what we're going to talk about is uh, some things about the background of Swift in the public cloud. We're going to describe our monitoring environment. And then we're going to describe some of the operational procedures we have. And then hopefully at this time, we'll, we'll have some questions and answers. Um, I should say as a preface, I, I'm going to assume that you know, uh, or you, you know what Swift is and how it operates. So th there may be some terminology that I use that you, you won't understand. Um, if that's the case, then just come up later and we can discuss it in more detail. Um, so the, the people on stage are here. We work in the Swift service team. So we're a combination of developers and DevOps people. Um, there are other parts in, in the public cloud. There are other operators. There are other people involved. So there's tech ops, and these are the people who look after the, the core of the, the servers. There's data center operators. So they're the people who go around the data centers, pulling out drives, replacing them, taking out servers, moving cables around the place. And then there's a network operations center, and that, that's, they're involved uh, in controlling the whole cloud. They monitor the cloud, and they, they figure out if things are going wrong. These teams are dedicated to, or sorry, are not dedicated to Swift. They're de they're, they, they operate the cloud generally, so that's all the services that we operate. Whereas the Swift team is specifically for Swift. And of course, backing up the Swift team is the, the OpenStack community itself, the, the core Swift developers, and that's where we get Swift, and we'll, we'll talk about what, we, what very minor op modifications we make. So we, this is our view of, of what happens in the cloud and how we manage it. So we've deployment, we've monitoring, and operations. So some of those are the aspects of which we're going to go through in this talk. The first part is around monitoring. Oh, sorry, the first part actually is about Swift itself. So in, in the public cloud, we actually we operate two data centers. We've been doing this for over three years now at this stage. Uh, we've 18 petabytes of raw storage. Uh, three and a half billion objects, uh, numbers of servers. We have hundreds of proxy servers, a little over 100, and we have 700 storage nodes. So we have about 8,000 drives under management. Uh, in, the features we use are standard, pretty much standard Swift. So we're, we're like everyone or most people, we're using tree replicas. And we map this to three availability zones. And I, I'll talk about how that affects our operational aspects in a minute. Uh, we have a single storage policy uh, currently. All our, we, pretty much all our drives are relatively uh, homogenous in the sense that they're all roughly the same type of drive. So there's, there's no uh, ability to give different storage levels. Or, so that's, that's why we have a single storage policy. It's predominantly upstream Swift, except we, we also have a, a content delivery network bolted on the front. And we have a few odd and odds and ends. For example, we have to support, uh, when we started this, because if you look at the, how long we've been operational, initially we didn't have Keystone in the, in the environment. We used SWAuth. And then we replaced it with Keystone, but, but we had lots of accounts who had, that had been created. So we continue to support those accounts. So to give you an idea, this is the type of server that, that we're, we'll be deploying in the future, or in the, at least in the medium term. Um, most of our, if you look at there, one of, the, one of the details is that we're looking at six terabyte drives, and obviously bigger drives that will be soon available are already, already available. Predominantly, though, what we have deployed at the moment are two and three terabyte drives. Um, but if you look at this example here uh, of what, what we're going to be deploying, so this is a front and a back view. So the front view showing servers, or sorry, disk drives, and then the back view is fans and other support. Um, when you look at a, a single rack like this, you get 1,620 1, terabytes of raw storage. And I put the terabytes in raw in quotation here because this is, this is what disk manufacturers give you. And of course, they use Desmo. 
when they're sizing things. So if you start doing, taking that into account, you take a replica count of three, you, you got a usability factor of about, say, 80%. So one of the things you don't want to do in a Swift deployment is actually literally fill your system, because your system will then become relatively unmanageable. And I actually have anyone who's familiar with this, a, a parameter called F, F allocate reserve. That's your friend. That will stop you filling up. So you should definitely use that. But if you look at that, those factors take three racks. You're looking at one petabyte usable in that, that size, state, size configuration, so three racks. Uh, most, but we have more racks than that because we are using smaller drives. I mentioned we use three zones, and this actually maps very nicely. We, we built out three failure zones, and when we talk later um, uh, about how we de deploy the system, you'll see how that, that also helps us. In these three zones, uh, everything is replicated. So we have load balancers front-ending the system. Those load balancers can send requests to any of the availability zones. Obviously, there's, there's power, cooling, et cetera, uh, is isolated each of the zones, and they all have their own networking, but they can talk to each other. So we can operate if we lose one of these zones and, and not have any downtime. Uh, that is actually yet to happen. We've never lost, a, in hardware terms, a complete zone. OK, so what sort of stuff can you expect to have? Now, as operators, you will have a different characteristic. This is, this is what we see in our public cloud. So this, this is kind of dedicated by, the, by the, our users, who, are, who range quite a lot from there's all sorts of different types of users in our cloud, Many of, most of which we don't, we're not aware of. Like I I'm personally only become aware of any, any given user if there's a particular problem with the user. So unfortunately, I never hear the success cases. I only ever hear the problems. Uh, however, there, there's some takeaways that are interesting. Most objects are small. And the bulk of the objects are going to be in the range of, of 1 to 64K. So that's actually this whole brand here. A very small percentage are kind of medium size, big, bigger than 100K. But it doesn't even show up on this slide. 0.01% of objects are what, you would, what most people would consider very large. However, you get a very different picture if you look at it from a space usage point of view. Most of your, half of your objects are those small objects I talked about, but that 0.1% of your objects occupy nearly half your space. Okay? And then we get a very small fraction. This is a an, an useful piece of data to know because if you're sizing, that of about, if you, of 1% of, of your total storage space would probably be taken up by account and container databases. So that's, that's what we, we, we see. Okay, the sort of operations you expect. This is operations per day. I've, I've normalized this to one petabyte of user data. So if you have a petabyte of user data under management, this is, you may have more storage there, but this, this, is, this is the amount of data you have. You can expect uh, <clears throat> a little bit more gets than puts, and then a, a large, you know, we're talking about millions of deletes, and then you get other operations, and they call head operations, uh, container listings, or th those sort of operations. These operations on the left, <clears throat> the put and the gets, contain data. So they payload in the operations. <coughs> so looking at it from a size point of view, um, what you can see is actually that, that puts dominate, so in, at least in our environment, and, and gets don't. Um, one thing I observe is not easy to represent here is that uh, some percentage of those puts actually get deleted fairly quickly. I'm not sure why, but that, that, that is a characteristic. If you remember the previous slide, we were looking at a 11, uh, 1 million or so deletes a day. Um, and the other thing is, the amount of data is not that great. So we were talking about four, three, four million operations a day, but you're only looking at like 2.5 terabytes a day. So that, that kind of backs up my contention. Most of those objects are small. OK, so the, that's what the cloud looked like from our point of view. So how do, what's, what is it from a sort of an operational point of view? So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we monitor the cloud. And I, I guess I should preface this talk by saying that uh, Swift is very highly available and very highly resilient. Um, in fact, one of its potential downsides is it's, it's too resilient. So you can actually build up a lot of problems in a, in a data center. And unless, you keep, unless you're on top of them, you're not going to be aware that they're there until something goes wrong, finally goes wrong. In fact, 
so you can lose many, many, many servers and even full availability zones and nothing happens, apparently. And then things go crazy. So as a result, we, we developed various tools. So one of the things we do is we, we, we from an external point of view, so that we actually kind of come from two, two approaches. One is looking from the outside and then we look at the inside. So for an external, we've developed this fairly relatively simple tool called Swift Uptime On. Uh, so one of the things about Swift is the way the ring is built, that if you, if you do several hundred, certainly to several thousand requests, uh, even in a very large data center, so if a, an individual user is doing a request, and presumably if they're all to different named objects, they're going to visit all of your servers in a relatively short amount of time. They're, they may visit, and they're going to ver visit a large percentage of your disk drives. So if there's any problems in that environment, they, they actually will see it. Most of their operations will work fine, so 99% of their operations will work, and then one operation will be extremely slow. And that can affect their overall performance. So, so this is one of the reasons why we watch, we watch this. So we, we, in, a, in a given cycle, we do hundreds of, about 100 requests. So over, a, over several different cycles, we'll have visited pretty much every drive in the system. And we measure and log um, soft failures, which is any failure at all, and then what we call hard failures. So Swift is a cloud, uh, I don't know, the application's probably the wrong word, but it's a cloud service. You can expect to get a failure, okay? We, we need to do things like upgrade software. So we have to be allowed to give you one failure every now and again. But a hard failure is different, so this is a hard failure after retry. We also ma ma manage, track the latency, and we, we look at the average. We also look at the max, so that we want to make sure that, okay, the average is fine, but occasionally are we seeing one of these higher glitches. And we have an ability to chart those as well. Uh, the problem with the, the monitor we just showed you there is that it's, it's inside our data center, so it's not actually getting, seeing things from an outside world point of view. So one of the things we use is, for example, we use Pingdom. It's a good way of looking at this type of data. I'm showing here two years of data. Um, it's, I'm not hugely pleased about the number of downtimes we have, so I went through, there's 16 outages, so I, I looked through those in detail, and, and most of them are actually DNS lookup problems of some sort. They're actually not failures in our service, though I'm happy enough with that, but from our point of view, that, that's still not great. But, so we're, we're looking over two years of 99.998%, so overall I think we're happy enough with that. The other thing we run continuously is smoke tests. So we're, we're checking on the operation of the system, and this, this will become more apparent. We, we, this, this happens all the time. It's not a regression test, so it only takes a few minutes, but it, it becomes more useful during deploys, and Lorcan will talk about that. So I'll, I'll skip on to that. So that's looking from an outside point of view. The other thing we do is we have an extensive set of tests monitoring the system itself. So there's, there's lots of obvious things you can do. So lots of people are familiar with uh, this, uh, this Swift recon tool. And async pending is, is kind of a number people often look at. This can be a very good indication whether there's something wrong in your system if you see this number growing. As I said, I'm not going to explain what that means in Swift, but I, I come to me to talk later. Uh, and the obvious thing you will need to do, but then over the, over the years we've developed sort of less obvious things like, for example, NIC speed. So it's, okay, it's all very well to say a NIC is working, but you need to make sure it's running at the right speed because when it's working, kind of unfortunately, it actually will operate normally. However, it's slow, so it's going to affect your end users. We also look at things like IO wait times. I'll, I'll actually have a little slide on that next. Uh, but there's lots of other little features we need to, to check out. And generally, we have a philosophy. If we find had a problem in the system of any sort, we will develop a monitor and, and deploy it. So it's very important to try and nail down every source of possible problem and make sure you know what they're about. I mentioned this a bit earlier. People are familiar with prediction, predict fail. That's the smart logic you get in drives, so the drives can tell you that they're going to fail. So we have deployed that. But in addition to that, that doesn't always actually work. Uh, there's there's a, a tool that's available. Collectal is a public domain tool from uh, one of my colleagues, Mark Seeger. And uh, by, we look at uh, I.O. patterns. So what we're showing here is, actually, I don't even know what the units are, but you can see there's a very large number of the operations completed in a very, very small amount of time. And then we bucketed it. So eight operations took longer. One operation took even longer. 
Uh, I actually, I don't know what the units are, but they're very short periods. But as you see, this guy here is clearly different than the other drives. This is, that can be a good indicator that things are going wrong with that drive. So if that's a normal operation, that would be, that would be fine. It can be a bit difficult to interpret that during very high periods of, rep of replication when the a drive is, for example, after it's been replaced, you will see uh, long wait times as well because the thing is very large. Most of our monitoring data gets viewed in a Singa, so people are kind of familiar with that, but that's what we use. And we also have a, a dashboard for metrics, and you've already seen kind of that. This can be useful for trend spotting, and we, we tend to show the last hour and the last seven days, just gives us an idea of what's going on. And uh, so that's, that's our monitoring. So actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand over to uh, Lorcan, Lorcan Brown. He's going to talk about the operational aspects of the data center. Thanks, thanks Donna. Um, so I'm first gonna talk about the Swift Runbook. Um, what is the Swift Runbook? Um, it's basically a set of, a compilation of routine operation, operations, procedures, and instructions, instructions for anybody who wants to operate the Swift system. Um, why do we have this from book? Um, well, essentially, as a service team, um, to put it quite bluntly, we don't really want to be doing all the day-to-day -day operations on a, on a system. Um, we have other teams who can help us with that, but um, these other teams don't share the same expertise as us. So in order to bridge the gap, um, we have a run book. So, um, when other teams are there, such as the tech ops team, the data center operations team, and the NOC team, if these guys see a problem or an issue, they go to the run book, and they can, they can fix it for us. So it removes a lot of our day-to-day -day work on the, on the cloud system. Um, I suppose, yeah, so we populate it, and the other guys consume it. Um, the two important things about this run book is that it's continuously updated. It's very rare that a week goes by when we don't do something in this run, when we don't do something in this run book, we don't make a change whether it be an issue that's cropped up that we need to document the procedure, how to fix it, or where we, whether we add a new feature and add a new check and just explain those checks. Um, the other thing is, whenever we add procedures, we try our best to automate them whenever we can. So for example, if we um, originally, we, when we had to replace a drive um, after a failure, we needed to first um, partition it, add a file system, label it, mount it so it's ready for swift consumption. Um, so this was put in the run book and it was a long, long process. And eventually over time we automated this, we deployed it to the system and we replaced these run book instructions with just run this script. Um, other things we have in the run book are, for example, there we have CMDB, which is Content Management Database, which keeps a, a constant record of all the, all, the, all the nodes that we have in our system. Um, monitoring results explanation. As Donna pointed out, we have a lot of uh, monitoring tools there and we have a lot of um, diagnostics. Um, where the service team may understand what the output is and know what to do when they get it. The other teams who aren't, who don't, who aren't exclusive to Swift, so they have other services that they need to worry about, don't have the same expertise, and they need to know when I see this alert, what do I do, uh, what procedures can I take, what do I, who do I need to inform. Then there's other things like basic system checks, is Swift up or down, um, log interpretation um, in the Swift logs, just what to look for, what, what certain log patterns mean. Um, just an example of how we use the run book and how we collaborate with um, the other teams are with the un un unrecoverable read errors. Um, this isn't something that's exclusive to Swift at all. It's once data has been written to a device, um, a sector of the device can no longer be read. Um, it's something that's becoming more and more prevalent in devices with, uh, with the growing size of these drives. Um, in the context of Swift, we see them in two ways. Um, firstly, all we, we, first of all, we see object um, URES which, Swift, which nicely um, Swift will fix these for us using the replicator and the update and the auditor and whatnot. But more, um, which is more um, important to an operator, there's also file system URIs. Um, these are URIs um, which there is a tool in Swift called Swift Drive, Drive Audit, which will scan the kernel log and find these URIs and um, inform the operator. But the operator themselves need to manually change this. Um, so earlier on, in, early on in our public cloud days, we enabled this tool, and we came across a few issues. Obviously, when we enabled it as well, we had the runbook procedures entered in, so um, there was quite a few things to do when you saw URE. Um, so it was enabled. We added the output. We gave the output of Drive Audit to our monitoring, so an alert came up whenever we saw some, some URE's. Um, but a couple of issues cropped up pretty quickly. Um, first, first of all was we were getting feedback that when URE's popped up, 
um, it was taking a considerable amount of time to fix them. Um, the procedure was just too long, and it was taking up too much time of the NOC especially. Um, they were neglecting other services and neglecting other issues in Swift. And the other thing we noticed was when we did fix the URE, the warnings weren't disappearing immediately. The alerts were still staying there. Um, this turned out to be an issue with Drive Audit where um, when you're looking through the logs, um, it looks back for a certain period of time. In this case, in our case, it was 24 hours. So if you catch a URE straight away and fix it, it still remains in the log for the next 24 hours. Um, our solution to this was to kind of automate the whole process and kind of improve the efficiency of how we read our Swift, uh, we read the, uh, how we read the output of Swift Drive Audit. So um, when it ran, it would give us a list of URE's and what would happen then is we had a script which would check these URE's um, and try and read them and see were they, were they in fact URE's or were they bogus. Um, if they were found to be fine and could be read, they were ignored. Otherwise, we put them into a, a temporary broken URE file. And this, if this broken URE file was present, then we'd, um, a monitoring tool would pick this up and give an alert. Um, if there was an alert there, then we had to improve the automation of this. So we wrote a script, we deployed it into our system, and we updated the runbook. So instead of taking 10 steps to do it, it was just run the script. The script read the broken URE file and fixed it all up for us. Um, while we're on UREs, I suppose it's probably something we see an awful lot of day to day. On average, in our system, we probably come across over one URE per day. Um, which translate to approximately five drives with URE per hundred drives per year, which is quite substantial. Um, and if they're left untreated, they can often lead to disk failures. Um, now I'm just going to talk about how we deploy in the public cloud in Swift. Um, this diagram here is just kind of the pipeline of our development lifecycle uh, in Swift. Um, so. At the, start, at the beginning, when a developer needs to make a change, he or she has to make their code change or their configuration change or their feature add. They have to put it onto one of our many development systems and make sure that it's OK. Um, these development systems, they all have smoke tests associated with them, and they also have Isinga running. So we can make sure that once the change is in there, it doesn't really affect our smoke test should still keep working, um, and our diagnostics and our monitoring should be fine. Uh, once this is OK and we, the developer tests that the change actually works, um, he or she pushes it up for peer review and it gets added to a code base ultimately. Um, then after a period of time, usually in our case approximately a month, we bundle all these changes together and we, we make them a formal deploy to go to production. Um, before they go out into production though, we, make this, we, we deploy them to a smaller QA system which mimics production in every way. It's just at a smaller scale. And in, in this system, we leave the code to soak for approximately a week, where again, there's also, there's still smoke tests, there's still monitoring um, tools there, but we also have extra functional tests, extra regressional tests, and extra integration tests as well. Um, what we find here is a week is quite conservative by lots of people's um, estimations. But we find that sometimes when you put a lot of changes together, it may take a week, a couple of days before these things um, to rear their ugly heads, uh, especially when you're dealing with other services such as Keystone or Glance, which you now are reliant on Swift, and you want to see how they operate um, at the latest code version, like what we have in production. So once this is all clear and we get the go-ahead from QA, we're ready to push this out to production. Um, and this slide here is just how we do our production deployments. Um, we have a particular way of doing this. Uh, the two main aspects of it are, first of all, we make sure the system is completely clean before we start. We do a pre-check where we make sure our smoke tests are all running to completion, that our Isinga is, cro Isinga is green across the board, that there's no errors, there's no problems, there's no warnings, there's no drives down. And also we have a quick look at our dashboard to make sure there's no odd, tre odd trends. We want to make sure that everything just looks normal. Um, the second part of the deploy, which is important to note, is as Donna pointed out earlier, we have our production systems split into three different availability zones which also correlate to failure zones. And, and with three replicas of Swift in our system, that means each, each zone should have one copy of Swift, uh, a Swift, uh, Swift object. Um, so with this in mind, we deploy to a single AZ at a time. And we do this because of the properties of Swift. So if you want to do a get operation in Swift, uh, all you need is one replica to be present there. 
And if you need to do a put operation in Swift, all you need is 50% of your replicas to land to get a successful, uh, to do a successful put. So when we do one AZ at a time, even if we brought down this AZ by doing just some mistake in our deployer, if the code was poor, and um, we'd still have two thirds of our system, so the system would still be up and there would be no downtime. There may be a small uh, performance decrease granted, but it'll still be working. Um, so once we deploy by AZ, we go back to our, we go back to our same pre-check tests and we make sure that everything's running and everything's clean. And then once that's done, we move on to the next, so next AZ and just rinse and repeat. Um, if at any stage during this, we do see an error in the, in the code or maybe I think it brings up some error or any, the monitoring is just goes uh, fills with warnings. We stop immediately and we revert back to the original code and, and that way our system is still up and we work out what went wrong. Um, the other thing to note here is sometimes deploys require rolling restarts and two points we like to make in it are when we do our restarts we like to limit it to approximately 10 or 15 servers at a time. Um, if we do any more than this, there can be a performance drop and that could affect our customers. Um, otherwise, as well as that, we have the reload instead of a restart. And the difference here is when we restart a system and if we restart Swift and there's a large transaction going on in the middle of it, say a large put of a few gig, um, we want that to run to completion. So at reload, we wait for all the transaction to finish, then we restart the services so there's no, no issue. The customer will always see the transaction completes. Um, one major act attribute of Swift is obviously the ring, and it's a big, um, it's a big deal operationally, and how to manage the ring in particular. Um, for those unfamiliar with the ring, it's just a basic data structure which decides um, where the data goes in the system. Um, each service, bar the proxy, must have at least one ring file. Well, the account in the container have one ring file. With storage policy, you can have multiple object, uh, object rings. Um, the way the ring file is managed is with the Swift ring, ring Builder tool, which is quite good, but unfortunately at scale, um, it doesn't quite work as well because you have to, for each individual um, change you make to a ring, so if you add, edit, or remove a device, you have to do an individual call to this Swift Ring Builder. So if you have, for, like, as Donna said, we have approximately 8,000 devices. Um, if you had to, so we, we're in the business of maybe adding or removing a few, a few, a few um, nodes or possibly even racks at a time, that means we may need to remove, say, 500, 600 devices. And to go through this is um, it's quite cumbersome if you do this one at a time. And it's also, there's a margin for error there. You could just make a mistake quite easily. Um, so with this in mind, we have to come around with a solution how to, how to do this. And it involved bring, putting a wrapper around the Swift Ring Builder and also use the use of CSV files. Um, so if you look here to the left, you can see kind of a sample of one of our CSV files. This CSV file represents, um, yeah, just there to the left. This CSV file represents what we'd like our rings to look like. Um, so you can see um, the first three non-commented lines are three rings, um, the account ring, the container ring, and the object ring in this case. The three parameters beside it are the common ring parameters, um, 15 being the partition power, which is far too low for a production system really, but this is just an example. Three is the replica count, and 24 is the time between rebalance or update. Um, underneath then, we give our list of devices that we want in the rings. And we do this on a node by node basis as, do, as opposed to a device base, um, purely for legibility. Um, if we have a couple of thousand devices in a, in a system, we don't want a, a huge long list. We want the operator, operator to be able to look at the system in a snapshot and see a small file we can decide you can see what's what. Um, the three parameters here are the IP address of the node. Um, the second parameter here, which is one, is the, is the zone that the node, the node is associated with. And the final parameter is the type. It's the hardware type, um, which gets read um, later on. So I'll explain that now in a sec. The, so with the CSV file, we have a wrapper around our Swift Ring Builder, a kind of a a ring script in, its, in itself that reads the CSV file. It looks at the IP addresses and it looks at the type and it says, oh, this type is an SC1170S underscore three. So it has, a, it has a list of supported devices there and it says, oh, this, this device has 12, this node even, sorry, has 12 devices, um, all of weight, say 100, and it, it, it needs to be part of all three rings. So it does that, it blows up the CSV file with that information and it compares it to the existing ring file that's on the system. 
Um, and with that, it'll generate a series of diffs. So if we were, say, adding uh, two nodes of 10 devices each, you'd have a diff of tw uh, 20 nodes that needed to be added. These get fed automatically into the ring builder, and the ring builder will produce our new rings. And then they're ready to deploy. So everything I've shown you here above the broken line is done offline pre-deploy. And everything afterwards is done during a deploy. Um, as I described earlier, what we do with our deploys and how we have our production, how we have our development lifecycle, that's what we do for 99% of the time. Unfortunately, with rings, it's slightly different. Uh, Swift rings are unique to each system. So if we edit a ring um, and create a new, or create a new one, we can't test it by putting it into a different uh, system. It just doesn't work. Um, so we need to come up with something a little. We needed to come up with something a little more careful when we were deploying them. We didn't want to deploy the wrong ring into the wrong system and that could be catastrophic. Uh, so what we did was, first of all, when we had our ring files, we got the MD5 sum of all these, all these files, and we added them as system, system parameters. Um, and on top of that, at the same time, we packaged our rings into a simple uh, Debian software package, which we could distribute easily between all the nodes. Um, so when, when the deploy started, in the same fashion as I've described earlier, we'd push these, um, we'd push these rings out and they get deployed on a temporary, in a temporary area, Varkash Swift. Um, they're put here and not an Etsy Swift so, so we can check them beforehand to make sure. So once they're deployed, we have another check that runs and says, oh, I see that we have some new rings in Varkash Swift. It checks its MD5 son and it sees, are they the same? If they're the same, then it knows it, need, needs, knows it needs to be pushed into Etsy Swift and then the service is gonna pick up on those ring files and you have your new rings distributed. Um, if this isn't the case, and for some reason the MD5s don't match, uh, the deploy fails straight away and we stop. Um, the reason for this is we, we can't afford to put in bad rings into the system. Um, it's going to be extremely dangerous. A lot of your services can act up very funny, and at worst case scenario, you could lose some data. Um, so another thing about when we deploy the ring is, at scale, um, you need to deploy a sequence of rings at a time. Um, on a smaller scale, you, you might only need to do one, but because of the properties of the, the, the rings, when you do a rebalance, you can only move one replica of a partition at a time. So with this in mind, you can't necessarily make big changes at once. So there's a technique which is quite common in Swift where if you're adding a certain amount of nodes, you gradually add the amount of partitions to the nodes in different ring cycles. And so when we deploy these rings, we need to know when we can deploy the next one and so how we sequence them and what time we can spread between them. So what we have here is we have, we have two tools, um, which are Swift tools, which we find very useful in this case. The first is uh, we check the replication time, which can be found in the Swift recon tool. Um, the object replicator simply goes around a node, um, checking to see are all the partitions in the objects where they should be, and it moves them if they're not. Um, normally, on a clean system, this replicator runs maybe in about 5, 10 minutes, 15 max. However, once you deploy a new ring, your partitions have been moved, so the replicator kind of kicks into overdrive, and it needs to take a far, takes far longer to complete. Um, so you're talking about maybe the time could multiply by 10 or 20-fold. Um, so we need, we need to wait for our replication time to go back to normal. So this indicates that all our partitions should have been moved in that time. Then, we, then that's a good indication that more rings can be deployed. The other tool that we use is the Swift Dispersion Report. Um, this is quite a handy tool to give a kind of a good uh, snapshot of your system. What it does is it pushes out a number of tiny objects and containers to a set percentage of um, partitions in your system. Um, and then when you run the report, you can see, you can check these objects and containers and see are all the replicas there or where they should be. So when your system is in good health and all the objects and containers are where they should be, you'll get a 100% report back. However, again, once the rings changes and the partitions are in different places to where they should be, you don't get, it, you don't get the 100% coverage and you wanna wait till that gets to 100% and then you can do your rings again. Um, a couple of things to note here, we don't um, change rings every time we see a device or a, or a, a driver or a server failure. It just isn't really an efficient use of time for us at scale. It doesn't work on a smaller scale one, perhaps, where you've only got a small number of devices. But because as Donna said, Swift is so robust, and as well with our monitoring tools, we can see when a device goes down and changes straight away. We just don't do it. We have about 
10 or 11 failures per month. <coughs> so if we do that, I mean, if we ended up doing all those ring changes, we'd just spend our whole time at it and it wouldn't be any use. And also, Swift proxies obviously aren't part of the ring, so they're much easier to add or remove. You can just take the files, you can add the files to them if you want to add a Swift proxy. You can pull the file, files away from them if you don't. Um, this is just a graph of our replication time over the course of a month where we did a few ring deploys. So as you can see, for most of the time, it's uh, extremely low, it's nearly at zero, but it spikes when we do a, um, when we do a ring change. It goes up as far as see, 1,500 minutes in this situation, which is approximately 24 hours. So that means we've got to wait 24 hours before we can, we can do this again, as long as the dispersion report also gives us 100% coverage. Um, these are quite spaced out, um, but from what I was saying earlier, as soon as that hits zero again, we can go again. So these, these four changes could have been done over a much quicker, uh, much quicker period. I'll just leave it there to give a summary. Okay, thank you, Lord. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay. Um, so this, when we were designing this, this talk, we, we were trying to understand what we would let, want you to take away. So, what, so one of the purposes of the talk was to explain, if, you were, if you're an operator, the sort of things you need to worry about. Um, but even, although that, that's important for you, time didn't allow us to go through. So when I went through the monitoring, I went through very, very quickly. So uh, uh, and originally when I did my first slide set, that was a very, very slide by slide by slide. So uh, you'll appreciate that uh, although monitoring is very important to you, we can't really go into too much depth here. But um, the, from our point of view, is, as I say, we monitor everything. Swift will continue to operate, but by being on top of your monitoring, you know when things start to break and can start making repair actions before things become a problem, okay? So that's important. You also want to make your operations, your procedures, repeatable, so whatever you're doing in your data center. So at one stage, we had a, a deployment that actually failed on us, and we, we had a little bit of downtime. It was due to a bug in my code. Uh, I'd written some code, and that ended up uninstalling all the software on one of the AZs. So afterwards, we've tried to figure out what went wrong, because as Lorcan was saying, we've got a pipeline where we test. And what we realized is that different operators were doing different things, and that ex one operator kind of hid that as a problem, and then the other operator who de deployed on the reproduction system followed a different process. So what we realized was that we need to make that repeatable. And so that's one of the reasons we have the run book, and that's a major reason why we have the run book. But it also, by, by doing that, then you, you, if you've got a procedure that works, then you're sure that it's always going to work. So as I said, keep on top of the problems. And so one of the things is that people obsess, certainly some of our colleagues in uh, the NOC, in the Network Operations Center, <coughs> watch the async pending. And that's something that can go very, very high, and there's all sorts of operational reasons why it can happen. However, if you understand why it's going high, then don't panic, okay? Just get around, fix the problem, and that number will eventually come down. Okay, we, we've seen numbers up in the millions, tens of millions of async pendings, but that's fine on a very large system. So don't panic when you see it, but figure out why it's happening and then go fix it. So what will you be doing day to day? as an operator. So general break fix, this, these are large systems, so bits of them break. So that happens at a pretty normal rate. Probably a little bit of a takeaway for you guys is that, in, at least in our experience, URIs is uh, a reasonable uh, amount of overhead that's something you need to fix. Uh, it depends on how many spinning drives you have. So we've so many of them, as I say, we're, we're looking at one to two a day. No. One to two, one, sorry, one every one or two days, that sort of order. Uh, and obviously, you need to review your system state. So if you're monitoring your system, please, mon please watch the monitor. And then finally, we didn't really touch on this, but the other thing you will get is, is users are going to have problems operating with your system. So you yourself as an operator need to know how Swift works in request terms, and especially some of the interactions. So one of our biggest areas that we frequently get problems is things like credentials. So they say they've got a problem with Swift. Turns out <coughs> they have a problem with Keystone credentials. They, they don't have the appropriate roles to use Swift, for example. So you need to be on top of that, understand that, because otherwise you won't be able to handle user queries. For some reason, static web seems to cause a lot of problems for users as well, so that's an, another area at least that bothers us. 
Uh, the tip typical case is that somebody's got a public container, they're viewing it in their browser, they enable static web, and then they get a 404 not found. The reason is, when they enable static web, they said they have an indexed file, index.html file. It goes look for it, but it, they actually didn't put a HTML file, or a H, uh, an index file there, so it's not found, and that's the, the reason. So those sort of little gotchas can happen all the time. Okay, so we can take questions. So if you're going to ask a question, if you can go to the mic there. <clears throat> so a quick question about drive failures. So when a drive fails, uh, do you replace it immediately, or do you, do you wait for a bunch, or what's the, what are your kind of we, thoughts on drive failures? We, what, by immediate, I wouldn't say immediate. We, we, as soon as we notice it, it gets scheduled for replacement, and then it's up to the, the data center operations people to replace it. It tends to happen on a shift-by-shift -shift basis, so it doesn't happen immediately. Um, so it, it can be up to a day before the drive is replaced sometimes, depending on if you're unlucky. But yes, we, do, we don't wait for a bundle, so yeah, um, we're not lights out. We're actively managing it. Kudos, Donna, for going over all this with us. Uh, some great operational experience. Thank you for sharing. I, I thought the ring packages was a kind of a cool trick. Um, when you guys are going through the uh, the replication cycle time, doing like a gradual capacity adjustment, how, are, are you just looking at the recon files to get the replication cycle time, and then uh, you had graphs, so you're feeding that back through like stats yeah. D emissions or? So in that's our dashboard. Yeah. yeah so no, so, but we're using uh, yeah. So uh, recon, uh, Swift recon yeah. uh, measures the rep replication time. So yes. Yeah. So we're plotting that data. We we uh, basically there's a, a metrics pipeline in our data center that we feed that data to. Okay. Uh, the other thing is we we also use the the recon uh, for replication. Is occasionally the replicators get stuck. And so you, you see in recon as the last replication period. So if you see that never moving, then you know you're in trouble and you may need to restart the replicators. Yeah. So the data's there. Swift recon gives it. And we just pull it out relatively easy. Yeah. Hi. Quick question. Yeah. So do you load balance user traffic away from zones that are under maintenance? No. Protect the read? No. So you just mix no. in read traffic? Uh, so or? actually, I noticed Lorcan actually just admitted that point. If you notice during a, when we're restarting, there are occasions when we need to restart demons. Mm -hmm. And so we actually limit the number of demons we restart. So our core thing is to do a reload rather than a restart. Mm -hmm. uh, but even in the reload, we limit the number we do. Because there, there is a, a, a very small window where the load balancer thinks it has, it has just talked to one of the proxy servers. So it thinks it's up. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're, we're in the process of reloading it. So it will send its next request in there and possibly get a failure. So we keep the numbers relatively low. So that, that we typically users, we expect users to do at least one retry. Okay. okay? And that, that's a core premise. Okay. Uh, right. And so that's, that's how the system operates okay, effectively. Thanks. Hi. Not, a, not specifically a Swift question, but what's the, uh, what is your policy on um, uh, firmware consistency or, or inconsistency between your AZs? Yeah. Uh, this is clearly an so, yes. We, so we, we, we check that as part of our, our processing, yes. We, we, we have a kind of a baseline of what we expect the firmware to be. Um, it's a, sometimes this can be a little hard to figure out, and sometimes you need to have your systems under, use your systems for a while to, to realize whether or not you've got the correct recipe. But we have seen strange operations at the Swift level due to Swift firmware f versions not being correct. So that is something you do want to check. Yeah. But within the AZ, do you run a consistent firmware across all your devices, your yeah, servers? All, all the Swift, all the firmware should be on the level playing field across our, across our whole system, not just for AZ. Yes. And of course, one of the problems is in a break-fix break environment, if somebody pulls out some component, puts in a new one, the replaced component may not be, maybe an old part, so may have out-of-date firmware. So that's one reason for tracking your firmware. So you have to reschedule to get that fixed. Yeah. So actually, I have two questions. One is about the 
the disk recovery. So right now you use six terabyte drive. Do you have a number like how long average it take to recover the data? Um, it's it's um, it, it's dependent on how many um, URIs you have in your drive. You could have multiple URIs in your drive, and that just takes longer. So I couldn't really give you a figure. So let's say a typical case, because right now the trend is the driver is going to be larger and larger. Yeah. Right, we have an eight terabyte drive by the end of this year, mm -hmm. and everybody use ten terabytes next year. Yeah. So will that be a problem for the Swift design? Yeah, so you're talking about a complete drive replacement, the data drive. Yes, yeah, oh, so if you completely drive. replace a drive. Oh, that's so, just the replication. Yeah. So, yeah. so how long is that taking? Um, uh, it depends. It, it depends on multiple things. I mean, if you have, if you, it depends on the capacity of your disk. If your disk is at fifty percent, it might take, I think, at fifty percent, uh, and it's replaced, it might take about twenty-four hours. But again, it depends on the number of partitions and whatnot. Yeah. So, you're, you're they're, so, so they're, but yeah, to, to, to that question, yeah. they're relatively small drives. We're, we're looking at two, three terabyte drives. So we have seen up to 24 hours to, for a replacement of a single drive for it to get back in sync. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question is, uh, since you guys run the public cloud, mm -hmm. uh, do you guys do anything like uh, to protect other customer from one or two particular customer who use the system heavy, heavily? Sorry, I'm, I'm not so quite clear. So how you do the resource isolation part? Okay, so, so um, yeah. yeah, so, so we, we, we have rate limits on the number of operations you can do on a container. Um, and that's pretty standard practice in Swift. But that, that's kind of more dedicated to very, very large containers can, can slow down. So you do per user container? Yeah. But, but the, 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 core, the, the core answer to your question is, no, we, we don't have any particular mechanisms for mitigating uh, the noisy neighbor problem, as you say. One of the aspects of Swift is, because of the way it distributes everything everywhere, um, as I said, if you, if you've, if you've an oper somebody does two, 3,000 operations, they will visit most drives in our system. So as a public cloud vendor, yes, most, you will see operations happening on most of the drives. However, it, it is, remember, it is, the, the system scales out, mm -hmm. so as a result, um, you know, we, you, an, an individual will find it very hard to target any one bit of our infrastructure, right? Because you, you, you even, on a, unless you cre repeat it again, the same operation to the same object all the time, you, you won't be going to the same place most of the time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think we've been told we can stop now, so if anybody, yeah. anyone has any other questions, just come up afterwards. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you.